Welcome everybody to the uh, our 24th webinar in this OPAR Omics portal. Uh, <laughs> sorry, the P30, NIDA P30. Um, I would will need Laura's help to get get our mouth full of the title of our grant, but this the focus has been on substance use disorder genetics and genomics and resource development. And um, the webinar has been a surprise uh, to us, a huge success uh, compared to the previous way we had been reaching out to the community. So um, this is one of the one of the silver linings of COVID, I guess, is that we've been uh, we've moved to the webinar format. And this is um, going to be a, a, a really cool uh, presentation from Dr. Uh, G. Allen Johnson. Al is how what he goes by, um, who is a senior faculty at uh, Duke University. He's been there for more years than he cares to admit, unless you give him a beer, uh, but going on 45 53. years, am I close now? 53. Uh, for 53, oh my God. He was a baby, in other words, when, when he enrolled. Um, and uh, he spent most of his career there, but a lot of it working with uh, at the very forefront of the first phase of nuclear magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, he's worked with all of the heavy hitters in, in that field, including those in commercial, the big uh, companies, uh, GE, Bruker, et cetera. Uh, he has been, he's the main person responsible for what we now, he calls and we call magnetic resonance histology, which is uh, focused on pushing MRI uh, down to the, well, up to the highest possible spatial resolution. And he will show you a lot of that today and show you how it can be brought in to alignment with, um, with other modalities. Um, Al has also been critical in uh, informatics, neuroinformatics in particular, since about 2000. He was very involved in the Human Brain Project and the, and the Burn Project. Uh, he has always been or been funded very well uh, by uh, the NIH for the Center for In Vivo Microscopy that he has now run for close to 20 years, maybe even a bit more than 20 years, which has been responsible, again, for a lot of what you'll hear today, uh, pushing the envelope on the MRI for sure but also do, uh, in, innovating on other cool uh, imaging modalities, PET, uh, confocal, et cetera. But definitely his love, his first love is uh, magnetic resonance imaging. He's a physicist by training. Uh, he always claims he knows no neuroscience, but I'm proud to announce that uh, we awarded Dr. Johnson an honorary PhD as a neuroanatomist recently. So uh, you can ask him anything you want about the habenula or the, the teg tegmentum, and he's sure to have some insightful comments on it. So Al, please take it away. Thank you, Rob. If you ask me about the habenula, I'll, I'll talk about tacos. I think it has to do with that. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here today. This is going to be, I work better in an informal environment. And while the, while the, online vehicle is very convenient, it lacks a certain personal contact. So I would argue that throughout this conversation, if there are people that have questions, let's stop and chat instead of putting them all at the end. I think Rob's going to be monitoring the chat session. And Rob, if you see something that is a worthwhile diversion, please uh, bring it up, OK? So definitely we'll do that. Yeah. The title is. is sort of broad, I'm going to be talking about a technology to some degree, but also some applications. Uh, as Rob mentioned, I started my life out in the clinical domain. I was the director of the physics section for Duke Medical Center for about 30 years in the early times of MR, of CT and MR imaging. My first job in 1974 was to install our very first CT scanner. It was the second one in the United States. And uh, boy, it's been an enormous entertaining activity to watch the imaging revolution come across us. So 
let's talk about let's talk about what I'm hopefully going to discuss today. So this is the last sentence from Paul Lauterbur's Nobel Prize winning seminal paper in which he says zoigmatographic techniques by which Paul meant imaging should find many useful applications in studies of internal structure, states, and composition of microscopic objects. So Paul, in his initial publication, realized that MR could be scaled to microscopy. And in that paper, he really didn't talk about the applications in clinical. He was a basic scientist. He was a chemist. And he saw that this was a wonderful thing for the basic scientists. What you're seeing there on the left of the screen is the method that he used. This is filtered back projection, which was common at the time for CT. And on the right, you see the first MR image. Um, it's, actually, it's actually two capillaries. Uh, about two years ago, I was invited back to the University of Illinois for where Paul ended his career and with several people helping them discuss a program project grant. And after the end of the day, uh, we were wandering down through literally the subterranean basement of the Beckman Center. And here was a bunch of, here was Paul's original machine, not this machine, the machine he built when he went to, to University of Illinois. And the very first data set, one of these projections right here, was just lying there in a box. So I took a, a screenshot on my phone and I cherish it to the day. So uh, Paul realized at the outset that there was a lot to be done in the basic sciences with this. So today I'm gonna to discuss a little bit about what we mean by magnetic resonance histology and how it complements and um, advances techniques when merged with other tech, uh, imaging methods. I'm going to say a little bit about the underlying sources of image contrast, and then show a brief presentation on uh, some work we're doing with neonatal abstinence syndrome, uh, discuss a little of the work we've done with Rob in neurogenetics, and then close with what Rob and I are working on right now, which we like to think about as the future. So to bring us into a sort of common understanding about what we mean by MR microscopy. On the left is a standard sagittal picture of a human, and each image element, each pixel in that image, is on the best of days, the signal from a one by one by one cubic millimeter, that is one microliter of tissue. In the diffusion tensor images I'll show you, it's usually from a two by two by two millimeters, that is eight microliter uh, chunk of tissue. I'll be showing you some images today. The, the gradient echo images are 300,000 times smaller in the mouse, and the diffusion tensor are two and a half million times smaller. So it's the same technology, but it's fundamentally different in the scale. And the scale is kind of important. So let's just look at this. This is a log scale of the volume of the voxel in cubic millimeters. So up here is clinical MRI at about one cubic millimeter. And there are some clinical MR systems, the human connectome scanners at Harvard and Stanford and a couple of other places can get down to some millimeter resolution. Um, a, people have done histology, MR histology of fixed tissues in clinical scanners where they can scan over a weekend and they can get down about another uh, uh, order of magnitude. And as I mentioned, the human connectome scanners have very strong gradients and they can go down a little bit further. If you go to smaller bore systems, the sort of systems you would find in a basic science laboratory, these are typically ranging in diameter from say 30, 30 uh, uh, 300 millimeters down to one of ours is about uh, 90 millimeters. And then down here, the MR connectome work, the, the special scanner that we've constructed will take us all down, down into about 10 to the minus six cubic millimeters. And you can see at this point, we're right on the edge of where optical microscopy starts. So what do we mean by histology? Uh, this was a paper in 1993. And at the time we were working on building gradients and we wanted something to scan other than capillaries. And as engineers, we didn't want to deal with live animal. Live animals move in the early preclinical studies that I did on a, uh, on a prototype system we put in the hospital, I would do live animals. I'd do them in the evenings. And at the end of the evening, I frequently have 
very limited signal. And the reason for that is the mouse usually had awakened and was underneath the floorboard of the computer floor and lost someplace in the hospital. So we wanted something that didn't move and something that had interesting structure. So we just started looking at chunks of tissue, kidneys and brains and that sort of thing. And as we were doing so, we realized, wow, this is pretty interesting. You can do a couple of things that were at that time, 1993, kind of important. One, it was non-destructive. We look at a chunk of tissue and then when we're finished, we still have that chunk of tissue. So if you want to do something else, if you want to do conventional histology, histopathology, light sheet, whatever you want to do, then there are all, what I'll talk about is proton stains. If I started talking to you about the spin lattice relaxation time, spin spin relaxation time, your eyes will glaze, glaze over quickly. The physics underlying this is unimportant. The point is that there's enormous soft tissue contrast. Again, old people's stories. At the time, we were putting our very first system in. It was the first high field MRI system in the world. I worked with friends up at General Electric. And, and my boss said, we're going to put this system in. He called me late one night, said, come over. Can you talk to me about it? I said, sure. And it was going to cost us about $4 million. It was going to take minutes to hours to do the scans. And the spatial resolution was going to be like one-tenth of what we could do from a CT scan. So why would we look at that? And the reason, of course, is that the contrast that you get in an MR scan, particularly in the brain, is considerably different than that of MRI. You get to look at distinctions between gray matter and white matter in MR that you'll never see in a CT scan. And now it's clearly three-dimensional. In the early days, it was stacks of two-dimensional slices, but now it's fully isotropic. And in 1993, it was kind of important that it was inherently digital. And that becomes even more relevant now as we start talking about doing registration of multiple atlases. We start talking about machine learning and artificial intelligence. We hopefully we can show you some examples. So here's work from, again, quite a few years ago when we were working on developing an atlas of the mouse embryo. And so this is a, an embryonic E I think it's E17.5. It's at 20 microns. This is something called a gradient echo. And the movie is just a slice through. The slices are the same spatial resolution as the in-plane resolution. So if I turn around and slice in any alternative plane, I have not lost any spatial resolution. And as you can see, there's really quite significant contrast. You can see the eyeballs. You can see some of the small nerves through the, through the heart and to the liver and down to the kidneys. So the three-dimensional nature becomes kind of a, a really important element of this. And the proton stains then become the next one. So this was a slide provided by my friend and teacher, Linda Gray. Linda was part of a course that we put on for about 25 years, teaching radiologists what the physics of MR is about. Radiologists are really quite astounding engineers and physicists. They will learn what they need to learn to do their diagnosis. And in this case, it's a just fascinating demonstration. On the left is an MR image of a patient who has a stroke. And the image is acquired with the most conventional MR scanning protocol, a T1 weighted sequence in which things which had long spin lattice relaxation times are dark and things that have shorter spin lattice relaxation times, that is the time that it takes for the tissue to recover after excitation, are, are bright. And in the next panel, you see a T2 weighted image that is determined by how quickly the tissue, once you're excited, how quickly that signal decays. And it turns out in cerebral spinal fluid, T2 is very long. And so when the tissue excites, is excited, if you wait some time, there'll be a lot of signal in CSF. And you can begin to see some evidence of the stroke, primarily because of edema, collections of CSF. But on the right is an image at lower spatial resolution, but using a method that probes for the microscopic diffusion of water. This is the diffusion weighted image, and you can see now that the stroke is very clearly defined because in those areas of tissue that have experienced ischemia, the cells shut down. As the cells shut down, the potassium pumps shut down and there's very small swelling where extracellular space, extracellular fluids 
move to the intracellular space. And when that happens, the diffusion coefficient in the intracellular space is about 10 times less. So this is an enormous progress. You can see strokes the minute they happen using diffusion weighted image. And the reason for that is shown in this cartoon. If we have a neuron and we encode the signal based upon diffusion, the diffusion is pretty isotropic in the stoma, in the, in, in the cell body. But if we look at measuring diffusion in the projections in the axons, the myelin wrapped around the axon restrains the diffusivity. And so the diffusion is structured. It's now sort of no longer isotropic. And we can exploit that by applying gradients to during the diffusion. So this is sort of, again, a cartoon of what you might think about. If you put a drop of ink into the center of a brain, um, you might expect it to diffuse readily isotropically, but it won't because of the isotropic nature of the tissue in the brain. And this provides us a vehicle for looking at about a dozen different contrast metrics, the diffusion along the highest diffusivity direction, the diffusion along the lowest diffusivity direction, ratios of the two, the total amount of diffusion, a whole bunch of different physical metrics, which can be thought of as different proton stains. You can see that in this fixed perfusion, fixed tissue, a mouse brain. On the left-hand side is an image acquired with no encoding gradient, no diffusion encoding gradient on. A gradient is simply a change in magnetic field magnitude as I move from one direction from another. So in this central image, as I move from the lower right-hand corner to the upper left-hand corner in the magnet, the gradient causes the magnitude of the field to change from here to here. The direction is always remains fixed, but the magnitude changes. So as I go from the back of the brain, back right-hand side to the front left-hand side, there is a change in the magnitude of the diffuse of the magnetic field. And if you look in anterior commissure, you can see that there's a little, it's a little bright here and it's darker here. And that's because diffusion across the anterior commissure is not ready, it's not easy because the myelin in the, in the bundles there, but over on this side where the spins are diffusing along the main axis of those bundles. And if we repute, if we reverse that gradient, now going from bottom left to upper right, you see the opposite thing happens. So we can use that to our advantage. And we're going to start talking about now the method that Rob and I have been working on for about two years, which we're calling high dimensional integrated volume with registration high diver. I got to give that to Rob. That's his marketing skill. He is the, uh, the wizard of this. And in the high diver method that we're talking about, we do all of the MR in the skull, and then we take the tissue out and we send it off for light, uh, light sheet microscopy. And then we have a bunch of computer stuff that lets us merge us all into a common space. And in that common space, we can label every single voxel in the brain. So when we look at high diver, this is one of our recent uh, images from a 15 micron data set. As I mentioned earlier, the diffusion tensor images in this data set are two and a half million times higher resolution than a clinical scan. This is something called a gradient echo. There are no diffusion encoding gradients on during this scan, but this is what happens when you put the diffusion gradients on. You can see the difference in the contrast that immediately jumps out. In the dentate gyrus, you see layers here in the hippocampus that just don't show up in the gradient echo. You can see areas in the center uh, nuclei that are now beginning to be vis visible. This is just with the diffusion weighted on. If we now start looking at the ratio of diffusion weighted along the two primary axis, that is the axis in a voxel along which the spins can diffuse most readily and the axis perpendicular to that. So here's the diffusion weighted one but if we start sorting out the X, the anisotropy every place, you see that we're getting pretty much a map of white matter. 
And you'll also see that we're getting more layers in the hippocampus. And up here, what is, is this layer four or five, Rob? I've forgotten. Is that layer That's four? Five? Layer four? That's four. Yeah. So yeah. we're beginning to see the, the, the barrels. Here's the axial diffusivity. If you look at the DW, the radial, the, excuse me, the FA versus the axial diffusivity, I, I'm always fascinated by this one. There are some additional layers that are highlighted in this one. And then if you take all of this together, you can look at every voxel and say, okay, in this voxel, tell me the direction of the, tell me the magnitude of the diffusivity. And let's make the brightness of that pixel re linearly related to the magnitude. And then let's look in that pixel and say, what's the direction of the primary diffusivity? And if that direction is in and out of the plane, I'm going to label that voxel green. If it's left and right, I'm going to label it red. And if it's up and down, I'm going to label it blue. So now you can start seeing a whole bunch of things that were not apparent. These are all perfectly registered. So look at, look at those barrels out there. The barrels are clearly got some, some diffusivity going up and down. Um, you can combine these in multiple ways and make what we're going to be doing in the very near future, starting to generate synthetic images because again, the data sets are perfectly registered. I can combine them a half a dozen different ways and do all sorts of clever things with that. So here's a most recent demonstration that Rob has put together where we looked at that fractional anisotropy and we took a tangential plane right through the barrels. And you can see now that we lay out the barrel field in exquisite detail. This is from some of Rob's earlier work where this is a flattened section of that layer of, of cortex and stained with cytochrome oxidase. And there's very nearly a one-to-one -one correspondence between these. So you can unwind this data any way you want. In uh, the late 90s, a very clever fellow at Johns Hopkins, Shisuma Mori, realized that, well, we could do more with this. If I go to a voxel and I say, I sit in this voxel right here and I say, okay, the primary direction is up and a little to the right, let me go in that direction. I get to the next voxel and it's up and to the right. I mark it and go in that direction. I can start mapping the tracks. That is the projections from one part of the brain to another part of the brain. And so this was the beginning of diffusion tractography. And on the right, you see some of Susumu's first tractography in the mouse brain. Here is an application that we had in the rat looking at aging. This is postnatal day 12. We're looking at developmental biology. And now again, the color is, let me go back. There's the PND 12. Again, color left, right is red. Back front is green, up down is blue. This is postnatal day 12. And you'll see in just a moment now, postnatal day 40. And you can see that now as the myelin has formed, that the anisotropy has increased significantly, particularly in the optic nerves. You can see exactly when the, uh, when, when the animal uh, uh, when, when the animal first opens its eyes, the fractional anisotropy just skyrockets over a day, uh, goes up by about 30%. And they have used this clinically to look at some early studies in restoring visual perception with some gene therapies. It's really quite fascinating stuff. So this is from the work Rob and I just submitted yesterday in which we have started generating a new atlas. We had generated an atlas back in 2010 that was the first three-dimensional image of a mouse brain in which we could delineate the regions of interest, providing people a common reference frame. This is done clinically with a, a, a data set from the Montreal Neurologic Institute. It's called the MNI template. 
And we have now created a better template. Our first one was at uh, uh, 20 microns. These are now at 15 microns, but these have diffusion tensor in them. So here is the diffusion weighted image on the top. And here is the fractional anisotropy on the bottom. And the labels now are all consistent with the Allen Brain Atlas. The color coding that we're using here is exactly that of the Allen Brain Atlas. This is the um, dorsal image, or the, I guess the axial image of the uh, same animal. The diffusion weighted image, Rob's labeled, caught a putamen. Um, what's MD, Rob? Tell me what MD is. Medial. Medial dorsalis, yeah. Yeah. And EP, I should know that one. Uh, uh, that is, I think, into piriform. Piriform, yeah, piriform cortex. You can take these same labels, and we have other software in which we do our volumetric imaging and create volume images. In this case, we created a collection of all those regions of interest having to do with the olfactory system. In 2015, one of my students at the time, one of the best students that's ever come through the lab, a young man named Evan Calabrese, did this work in which we scanned the, the bejesus out of a, scan, of a specimen. This was at 43 microns. It was about a 10-day 10, 10 scan. And we scanned with many, many, many different diffusion encoding gradients, many, many different angles. And when we did so, we could get this color fractional anisotropy. But what we could also do is start burrowing down. So we're magnifying this region of the hippocampus here and generating these computer glyphs from 126 different samples in each pixel. 126 images were gathered, 126 3D volumes. And if you exploit a really powerful computer, you could do computational unwinding of merging and crossing fibers. When the fibers touch, it's very easy for the connectivity to get confused. But using some more sophisticated algorithms, we can wind, unwind those. And that let, let us do this, where now we can look and unwind up to four fibers in every voxel. Since we've got this good parcellation now from voxel space of time, we can go into the hippocampus here and say, all right, let's look at the hippocampus. Let's start seeding, random, just throwing sand, random seeds in here and saying, where do they connect? And these are the projections that those random seeds generate where the color is the strength of connectivity. And you see the contralateral side there is good connectivity, but stronger connection on the same side. And from this, you can generate a quantitative measure of connectivity every place in the brain. So on the left-hand side, we have only, we're looking at the connectivity only on one side of the brain. We get the connectivity from left to right and from right to left, from left to left and right to right. So there are four different squares like this. We're looking at only one quarter of the data. And so if you look at the hindbrain and you say, how is the hindbrain connected to the isocortex? This part of the isocortex here, there is a fair, fairly strong connectivity. The scale here is a log scale. The color scale is a log scale. So as I go from blue up to yellow, it's really quite a significant change in connectivity. And then if I look at uh, the subpallium, subpallium is also strongly connected to the isocortex over here into the diencephalon. So this connectome now allows us to start generating quantitative measures of the wiring diagram in the brain. So about three years ago, was it three or four that we started on this, Rob? We asked a simple question. If you could generate a connectome, would it be different between a C57 and a black six, or perhaps through a B, uh, uh, one of the BXD series. It didn't seem like, you know, to me, a physicist, it's sort of like we're looking at the face and genetics controls a lot of facial features. 
with those same features, would you see features of the internal part of the brain compared? And this is what we saw. This is a B6 male, a D2 male, and we included a BTBR, which is a model for autism. And you can see immediately the uh, colossal defect here in the center. You can also see changes in the thickness of the corpus callosum. And there are also some subtle changes in the intensity between here and here in the D2. You can see changes in the fimbria. There are just an enormous number of things. Rob was picking up changes here in the olfactory bulb where the, the, the insertion into the brain. I won't try to go much further than that. I'll lose my anatomy credentials here. And this is the connectome comparing a, one of two of those. We're comparing the B6 and the BTBR. And so the connectome is, the strength is the brightness here. And if I go to a single node, a single part of the brain and say, show me everything that is connected to that section of the brain, I get this line of data here. So I'm gonna show you the comparison of this line of data in the B6 and that same anatomical series of connections. This is from the corpus callosum on the left-hand side. And on the left-hand side, the corpus on the B6, you see lots of bright yellows over here and it continues over to the right-hand side. On the right hand, there's collect, connect, and connectivity clear across. On the BTBR, the connectivity is considerably reduced. See over here, there's lots of blue. There are fewer projections over to the right side. You can see that up here. There's this sort of empty space up here where we, we are seeing much more connectivity here. You can now get quantitative metrics of what's connected to what. The problem with that, ideally, you would like to just say, well, I'll subtract this one. I'll subtract the right from the left. And everything that's left is what was connected more on the B6. Turns out that the math is a lot harder than that. That just doesn't work. It has to do with whether you believe in Euclidean spaces or not. And apparently, we all do. So you have to do something more uh, significant mathematically. And a couple of very clever mathematicians working with us up at Hopkins came up with this method. This is Kerry Preeb and Josh Vogelstein's work in which you take, you take this node and you say, all right, I'm going to characterize that voxel in terms of all of the connections that it sends out. So it's an anatomical feature of that part of the corpus callosum. And I'm going to describe a vector of that. And when you do so, you can put those vectors all into a common space, doing some very clever lower dimensional studies. And when you do that, you see that the B6 segregate out from the D2, the green, and they segregate out from the cast EJ, which was the other sort of normal mouse that we have. And those are all substantially different than the BTBR. The graph at the bottom shows you how confident you might be of those differentiations if you did just bone Ferroni corrections and then a more sophisticated corrections. And this is comparing all of the strains together. And even when you're, when you're doing that, there are about, oh, about 200 of the regions of interest that we have that are different. But interestingly, when you take the BTBR out, which is the kind of outlier, you still see about 150 regions that are substantially different between just common mice. And you can see that you can now identify those regions. And so here's the corpus, the substantia nigra, internal capsule, and the fimbria for the B6 on the top and the D2 on the bottom. And you can see in the substantia nigra, there's a lower connectivity, lower connectivity here internal capsule, a little bit lower connectivity as well, even in the fimbria. If you start looking at the BTBR, now we're looking at the C57 on the left and this model of autism on the right, see how the crossing fibers here in the cerebellum and these projections from the back. And you can see the colossal defect. You can see this projections, these projections into the cortical areas are considerably reduced 
on this side. Let's see if I can stop it here. No, I can't stop it. So, but the orderly arrangement and the normal C57 and the disorderly arrangement in the BTBR is really quite dramatic. So the reason you all came today, the one study where we've been looking at something related to drug exposure is work with uh, Mark Carone and Lauren Slotsky here at Duke, in which we looked at the impact of in utero exposure to heroin. Animals were exposed in utero with two groups. We then, they, they were administered the doses that you see on the right, we then generated atlases by taking the animals from one group and registering them all together into automated sham and treatment groups. That's what I mentioned in the early slide about things being inherently digital. We can start morphing all of these together, something that you can't do with conventional histology, of course. And then you can generate statistical comparisons using the same comparisons that I just showed you for the C57 and the D2, um, Catherine Hornberg has been able to pull out, these are the heroin, if we're looking at the cingulate cortex or the secondary motor cortex. So the heroin differentiate from the control quite nicely in a different dimension for the motor cortex. And so we can start teasing out looking at those regions. So the images I'm going to show you in the subsequent slides are just the projections, just the tractography. And so you see the tractography posted here on a volume rendered version of the brain. You can see olfactory bulbs, the eyeballs and so forth. You can see projections into the olfactory bulbs. You can see projections into the cortex. This is motor cortex here. And so when we look at the cingulate cortex, a couple of things show up. First of all, there's significant reduction in projections across the midline. You can see there's significant reduction here in these cortical projections. You can see significant reduction in the motor cortex projections. This was a particularly interesting development we had not expected. We scratched our heads for a little while because here on the heroin exposure, you're seeing some projections across the midline that we're not seeing as readily here. You're seeing kind of robust projections right here. But it turns out that this is kind of in the secondary motor cortex. And this is kind of what you might expect if you were looking at ADHD. And apparently, that is one of the behavioral phen phenotypes for some demonstration of NAS. So I started by saying we were going to include MR and light sheet. And light sheet is a reasonably new invention. It comes from the work that I think Dieseroth did some of the first work on this, in which you can immerse tissue in solutions that essentially match the index of refraction between the intra and extracellular space. And when you do that, the light no longer refracts at the surfaces of all the cells. And when that happens, the tissue turns clear. You can then use this in a sort of souped up confocal microscope. And I'm sure the people who have spent their years developing this would be upset at my description. But you can immerse these in a chamber that maintains this index of refraction. And you generate a sheet of light with a laser. And you scan that sheet of light through the clear tissue. And if there are fluorescent sources in there, you excite them. And you capture them in a wide field objective. So this is work we started about two years ago, working with friends up at Life Canvas, a small company up in uh, Cambridge. This is an animal that expresses YFP whenever thigh one is expressed in certain populations of thigh one. 
It's a 3D image. You're looking, the individual dots are individual neurons. You can see the projections from some of those neurons. We can fly inside the brain. See large collections of projections. The problem with light sheet is that once you take the brain out of the skull, it deforms. Once you start putting it in the clearing and staining solutions, it swells. Once you start handling it, there are tears and distortions, even getting it out of the skull, even the best uh, vet tech still has problems. So here you see the red is the light sheet image before we've corrected it. The green is the same data set, but now we've used our diffeomorphic mapping process, our computer process, to match the voxels in the light sheet to their corresponding voxels in the MR histology. So we take, it's, it's almost a Humpty Dumpty sort of thing. We put it back together again. We put it back in the brain from a computer standpoint. And you can see the distortions here are substantial. You see up here in the olfactory bulb, because it sort of floats around, it's quite distorted and swollen. The distortion up here is as much as 100% larger than the original tissue in, in the skull. And you can see how well we've done in this image. The green is now new N, where uh, you can see it's superimposed upon the diffusion weighted image. I've magnified this up here, and you can see a line of cells right here with the yellow arrowhead. It's one or two cells thick, and we're resolving that in the diffusion weighted image. Rob pointed out here the dragon head that we're seeing in the dentate gyrus. This is about one cell thick up here. And if you hold your eyes, squint just right, you can almost say that you're resolving that up there. This area right here is about five cells thick and it's pretty visible in the diffusion weighted image. Uh, looking at radial diffusivity, a different one of the proton stains should be related to the myelin. Here's the myelin basic protein. And now merged together. And back here, we're seeing projections into a single, into a layer that's about a single cell thick of pyramidal cells. So we can take that same data just interrupting with Purkinje cells. Per Purkinje cells, what did I say? Did, it, did I just lose my, my authorization to talk about anatomy? <laughs> you, you, mentioned, you mentioned pyramidal cells, lots of pyramidal cells there, but uh, the arrow was pointing to the uh, Purkinje cell layer. Begins with P, Rob, I got it part right. Sorry, Purkinje cells, that's right. Thank you. Um, so, now we can take that same light sheet and the MR. So we're looking at the light sheet now, just slicing through. So this is the corrected light sheet from a thigh one animal. And you can see the projections. I've zoomed in on one of the cortical layers and I made the sheet about uh, the slice about 20 microns thick. Now this is the yellow are the tracks that are generated in this diffusion tensor. And these have been extrapolated to five microns using a super resolution technique. Rob, I think you always do a better job of explaining what we're seeing here. You wanna chime in so I don't make another mistake? Well, I, if you're a neuroscientist, you're blown away at this point, I hope. I mean, I sure, I, I am. Every time I see it, I'm blown away uh, by being able to overlay uh, the the light sheet with the the DTI in this case. So um, the light sheet will be pretty obvious to any of you that have have worked with fluorescent uh, these these YFP GFP mice. So you're looking at layer five pyramidal cells there. What's what's new, completely new, is the super resolution DTI um, where you're looking at primarily 
uh, bundles of fibers, fascicles coming up into the cortex. And then in the superficial cortical layers, you're looking at bundles of dendrites that are flaring out and forming arcades in layers uh, one and two. But it's, it's, it's a, yeah. Um, Keep the going, fact, Alan. So the other thing that I know Robin and our other genuine neuroanatomist, not me, Len White, were fascinated by was looking at the patterns that you see as you cruise back and forth through these data sets. So since they're volumetric, and because we put a computer infrastructure in place that lets one do this, I can go back and forth, looking back, up, down, in, out. And that interactive nature becomes kind of crucial to our long range goal. The problem with that is the big data problem. So a single 3D MR volume is about 1.2 gigabytes. But to generate the diffusion tensor, we may take 126 of those 3D volumes. So that's 250 gigabytes. Then when we send the light sheet up, when we send the specimen up to live canvas for light sheet, we get back three channels and each channel is about 250 gigabytes. By the time you register those all together, the data volume for that one specimen is about a terabyte. Now, putting this in perspective, that's about that's the equivalent of about 7,000 clinical neuro patient studies. So that's, I don't know, we do about, I suspect we do maybe 600 neuro scans a day. So it's 10 or 12 days of all the scanners. We've got uh, 22, no, 21, no, 22 CT scanners and 19 MR scanners. We've got 19 MR scanners, a couple of them scan double shifts. And we just generate buckets and buckets of uh, bits, but not nearly as many bits and bytes per specimen as we are for these. So there's got to be some clever way to deal with that. The first thing we did about five years ago, I started fixating on, gee, what are we going to do with all this data? Where are we going to put it? How are we going to keep track of it? How are we going to look at it? How are we going to analyze it? And so we built this computer infrastructure. I'll not bother you with too many of the details. It's just that we just divided the process up into the, the steps in which we had to develop computational resources special for each step. Our acquisition, all of our scanners have big scratch disks, big memories, all of the structure necessary to house a lot of data while you're acquiring. During the acquisition, they throw it over the wall to a cluster. The cluster is a whole bunch of computers. There are about 1,000 CPUs in our cluster, cluster and about 10 terabytes of memory. There's 100 terabytes of scratch disk, and there's a very high speed 10 gigabit per second switch that connects all of these. We then have an Oracle archive that is, will handle up to a couple hundred terabytes. And then once we start processing these, we generate what we call grid servers. The grid server is, it, it's, it's actually a bunch of these high performance GPUs that the same things that are used for the, uh, for the gamers. And when I first started doing this, one of the people at NVIDIA uh, invited me to give a talk out of one of their presentations. It was quite fascinating. It was out in San Jose. And I put on my Brooks Brothers uh, sport coat. Remember sport coats? Everybody remembers sport coats? Anybody still got a sport coat? I still have a couple sport coats. I put on my Brooks Brothers sport coat and went out there to give a presentation. Well, the sport coat was definitely out of style even before pandemic. I was two standard deviations out of the age group, even when I was younger. The mean age was about 20 and the mean um, dress code was <laughs> far beyond mine. But these people have been looking at big data sets for a long, long time. When you look at World of Warcraft and all of the, the volume rendering that they do, they're prepared for really big data sets and they're prepared to share them. And so we latched on to that idea 
so that we can share, Rob and I can share our data set across data sets across the web. We can interactively work with them. Rob and David can be looking at the same data here that we are looking at it. And we are now assembling them into what we're calling image libraries. That is a collection of data about a theme in which all of the data is interactively accessible. So the future that we see is interactive MR light sheet at on the order of five microns for the super resolution, on the order of a couple of microns for light sheet. We had a wonderful disc uh, discussion with our friends at Life Canvas. I guess it was Tuesday last week, and in, in which, you know, I ha haven't beat Rob up yet today on my standard beat up of him. When I tell him I can do 10, he wants to do 100 specimens. When I told him he can do 100, he wants me to do 1,000. But the other end of the spectrum is when we're at a micron, he wants to go to a half a micron. And when we're at a half a micron, he wants to go to a tenth of a micron. And our friends at Live Canvas tell us they can go to higher resolution, but we will be soon getting to points where each volume is three, four, five terabytes. And once we combine them, we'll have 10, 15 terabytes per specimen. So the game is not over for handling big data or the size of what data sets that we can handle. Uh, we're having wonderful conversations with people at Oak Ridge right now to see if we can get them on board to help with this. We think that the idea of looking at multimodal, the whole brain, and the whole brain at both the micro and meso scale, look across the whole brain, find the areas that are interesting to you, and then zoom into them with sufficient spatial and contrast resolution to have a better picture of what's going on. And then finally, to have these all registered in a common space so we can look across a population of C57s, a population of BXD89s, of BXD22s, BXD77s, a population of all of those. We have now about 100 specimens that have been scanned at 45 micron uh, with 20 different strains. And we're reducing that data as we speak. We have now gathered 60 of uh, the specimens at 25 microns from with and without the 5X FAD gene. And we're beginning to uh, digest some of that now. And we expect that the, the final solution, well, that's probably not, nothing will be the final solution. We'll continue to build, but we expect AI diagnostics to come in soon. And so these are some of the people that have played a crucial role in all of the work that we've been doing here. And I think, I think I have one, I have this little bit of eye candy here. This is whole track, track, track density imaging going from the front of the brain to the back of the brain, colored in the same way. Going through the hippocampus, you can see, I think this is where we are seeing apical dendrites. And I will stop at that point and thank you and see if there are questions. Maybe I'm early. Um, questions? That was just great, Al. Um, yet there were a couple of comments and questions. Um, one, let me just go back. I'm just, um, so Hockey had a question. I think there was one before that. Uh, let me go. Um, yeah, so I, I, let me just rephrase Haki M's question. Um, his literal question is, can you calculate this matrix, the, the one you showed for the connectome for the UK Biobank MRI data? But the question under that is, uh, given every, your, your introduction uh, and the kind of compare and contrast with human clinical MRI, and even some of the GWIS uh, research human MRI, I data. What what do you think the strengths and weaknesses of the uh, using human populations versus using rodent populations for for this kind of work are? Uh, let me start first with the thing that I know a little bit about, and I'll end with the thing that you know a lot about. If you look at the biobank, for example, the UK biobank and the human connectome and the uh, Alzheimer's disease neuroimaging network and the Enigma network are all generating human connectomes. And so it is common 
it is routine to generate human connectomes in a lot of basic science studies. Uh, here at Duke, we do connectome studies in AD. Uh, a lot of connectome studies done for the surgeons if they're doing uh, resect tumor resection, so they'll generate a connectome. The whole field of connectomics is controversial for two reasons. Reason number one is you have this community of neurosurgeons, radiologists, uh, physicians who want answers to human questions. And at the other end of the spectrum, you will have the hardcore neuroscientists who have spent their life looking at cortical projections and specific cortical projections in a specific region of the brain at micron and submicron levels. And those folks will typically use retroviral traces. And so the Allen Brain Atlas has done that with retroviral traces, and they've generated a connectome of the whole mouse uh, by injecting a retroviral tracer in a single location, then doing a complete histologic exam for that one location. And after about two or $3 million, about four or five years and 1600 animals, they've assembled this whole connectome. And it turns out that the, there are a lot of false positives in the human setting. The scale difference between that mouse study and the human study is just ginormous. I tried to show you that it's like six orders of magnitude. And so you go from a situation where you have tens or hundreds of thousands of neurons in a voxel down to situations where you have tens of neurons in a voxel. And so the connectivity studies that are done in humans suffer a lot of problems with false positives. We think we suffer few, fewer, but we still suffer uh, some false positives. So as in most scientific studies, a little humility is really, really warranted here. We don't know when we are fooling ourselves. We could be fooling ourselves plenty of times. Rob embarrassed us to death the first visit over here. He said, well, let's just look at the optic nerve. And so we started tracking the optic nerve and he understands the optic nerve pretty well. He spent a year or two looking at that. And when it crossed the midline, Sometimes it was looking good. And then if we set the threshold wrong, we got a whole bunch of crossing the midline. So it was sort of, if you know the answer, you can get it. So there are flaws in this tractography. There are flaws at the level of the human setting and there are flaws at the level of our setting. We think the false positive, well, we know from some real measurements that the false positives are really, really far less in our data sets. The second part of the conversation is the difference between trying to do a GWAS study in a clinical population and to do a genetics study as what we're trying to do now. I'm not going to go very far because I think Rob has more insight into this, but we have so much more control and can gather so much more exquisite data that many of the things that we are doing now can be done with orders of magnitude more simplicity than a human GWAS study. The human GWAS studies are very glitzy and they're typically tens of thousands of patients. And the Enigma Consortium, there must be 500 sites around the world participating in Enigma projects, one phrase, one phase or another, but they're terribly expensive terribly difficult. You gather all that data and in the best of days, what you uncover is not as exciting to the geneticists as the degree of things that we can recover uncover here. Is that the right answer, Ron? Yeah, that that, that was very helpful, Al. Thanks. Um, I think, I, I hope that, that, got, uh, that was about as thorough an answer as you could get. Um, Olivier, you had some questions. You actually have two related questions, um, and you you can just shout them out. Um, sure. Thanks. Uh, that was a fantastic talk. I was really fascinated by this work. We, we, we've worked for several years of doing single cell whole brain imaging for uh, using FOSS as an immunology gene for addiction model, and, and we've encountered exactly the problem that you've highlighted. And one is trying to overlap the functional connectomics with uh, the tractography, 
and the second is the Euclidean space issue. So for the, for the first issue is uh, the DTI. So how consistent is it within a strain and between individual? In other words, can we use uh, the DTI that you have, for example, for the C57 and use that as a kind of a gold standard when comparing brain region on whether they're connected or not? And we use the difference in connectivity as a strength of connection to compare the functional data. And the second question was related to the Euclidean space and how you solve that problem. I would love to hear a little bit more about that. The first question I think you ask is how consistent is the tractography in one strain? That's exactly what we were trying to address in this paper. Um, and we took four, three pretty standard strains of mice, the B62, East, uh, uh, the CAS EJ. And so this tells you something, this graph tells you something about the consistency. So the, the blue dots are doing a global comparison of the connectome for all the B6. And so this is the spread of the connectome in the B6. And this is the spread of the connectome in the D2. They're different. They overlap a little bit. That blue dot touches that green dot. They overlap a little bit. And that's kind of encouraging. I mean, you wouldn't expect the connectivity to be absolutely different, but they're pretty different. So this is, this is the graph where we've removed the BTBR. We put the BTBR in there because we wanted to have a paper. And we didn't know whether we'd get <laughs> differentiation like this. And we wanted to have something to hang our hat on. And you know, if these were all clustered together, we could say, well, they you can't tell the difference between a B6 and a D2. It wouldn't have been a very exciting paper. But to me, the thing that was most exciting about this paper was not that we could distinguish the BTBR. Hell, you can distinguish the BTBR looking right here. There's no, no corpus callosum there. I mean, that's where I redeem myself in terms of my anatomy credentials. This one is fundamentally different than these two. But what's really interesting is this graph here. This is a bunch of statistics mumbo jumbo, but it says this plot here is a plot of the log of the p-values of the differences between these contrived vectors describing each strain. And we found these are the different vertices. So each one of these is a vertex. Each one of these is a node. Each one of these is a, you're in the game, so you know the thing I'm talking about. So each one of these, I've got 360 different, 180 on each side of the brain. And about 120 of them are statistically different between the three very normal strains. So I found that to be just remarkably um, encouraging. And I talked so much that I forgot your second question. So remind me again. Well, the second question is actually related to that graph that we are showing is uh, how did you solve that Euclidean space problem? And if you could talk a little, just a little bit more about how you, you calculated your, uh, um, those dimensions and how you, you came up to that. Um, so I, solved, I solved the problem by going out and finding some people that are a hell of a lot smarter than me. That's what Here I try to do right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, so in the paper, there, there's reference to the work that Kerry Preeb and Josh Fogelstein have been doing to look at this general problem in graph theory. The general problem in graph theory, and this problem in particular, is the number of false positives that can be generated in that graph is huge. And the false positives will just overwhelm you if you try to correct this. If you try to look at these graphs just based upon a bone Ferroni correction, you don't find anything that's different. Yeah. But if you treat instead of each individual, each individual element, instead of you try to uh, uh, treating them independently, you instead go back and say, I will form this artificial construct, which is a vector for this vertex here. And that vector is all of these components here. Then what gets done, the math 
is to reduce that vector to a smaller mathematical entity that can be mapped into a common space. And it, it really is quite elegant math. I understand about 10% of it. The, in the paper, Carrie has, Carrie's paper has, has gone into it in detail. It's, but if you're interested in that, Carrie Preeb, Josh Fogelstein are the wizards of that. And it, it is fundamentally enabling. Without it, you can't, you, yeah. you can't make any quantitative statements. Does that help? The answer yeah, is it helps a lot. I, I, I'm probably going to follow up with you later in an email and try to uh, to send me to an email and I'll give you yeah. I'll give you the the, the reference. Fantastic. Thank you very much for solving that issue. You know what I'll what I'll do, um, Al? I'll put I'll put the bioarchive link in to the high diver paper and and I'll also put, put a copy of of Al's paper that he just mentioned, the Wang et al. from 2021. Um, the, the other thing that's really, I just want to say this because humans tend to be obsessed about sex, is that if, if you put the images that, that Al showed with the three strains, Al, can you go back one slide to the, to the you had the three strains? Um, that is actually, these are, this is a stack of four males from each of those three strains. And in the original paper under it are stacks of four females. And I guarantee you that if I gave you the male and the females and told, ask you to sort them by sex, you would not be able to do it at all. But you would, in every time, you would sort it very reliably by genotype. In other words, even minor, minor tweaks in the olfactory bulb shape, those are reliable. This is not, this is not noise, what you're seeing in the upper part of the olfactory bulb. That is a strain attribute. It's, it's amazing actually. So I'll put that paper in there in the uh, chat uh, along with the link. Um, Marcelo, over to you. Hey, Marcelo. Hi, Al. Um, could you hear me? I can. Okay. Um, thank well, you so all much way for from that. Atlanta, you must be shouting. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> um, so wonderful talk. Actually, I have a different question from the one that I posted on the chat. Um, so you're you're getting very close to the level of, you know, getting uh, you know mapping the tractography, the, the axons in the brain. And um, what about the microvasculature? I think that would be very useful to translate results um, per voxel quantification of of connections, and then also have um, the vasculature mapped out or overlaid onto it in a way that could help predict what fMRI does or something like that. I don't know if that sounds crazy or not, but- No, not at uh, all. We have, we have a, a colleague at, at Oak Ridge that is anxious to do that. Um, I was hoping that I could bring a data set up here. If you look at, let's look at, uh, so can you see this axial yep. diffusivity image? Mm -hmm. So the vessels show up, show up really quite well here. Yep. And Rob, I'm ready. Is that a perforating artery? Uh, yep. Aha, look at that, look at that. I got to use the term perforating artery today. So um, I, I'm missing, ah. Uh, I do have what I want here. So I think I can show you that. Is it fair to try to show, bring up Citrix, Rob? Is that, do we have time? No, yeah, go ahead, we have plenty of time. Yeah, I think that'd be fun to see this live. So we'll, we'll see if we can, what we can see in the vasculature. Mm -hmm. uh, So I will start with, um, what shall I start with? I'll start with the DWI. So what I'm doing is a package called Emiris. Uh, and this we is still just see the PowerPoint. Are you showing us something on your desktop? Ah, okay. So I need to share something different. Yes. Yeah. Stop share. Thank you. And share.
There you go. Is that better? Yes, oh, that's good. better. So this is the 3D volume. And I'm going to slice it. Just amazing to be able to do this simultaneously with 26 people. So then we're going to add another image. Uh, and I'm going to add the um, let's add the axial diffusivity. Uh, So I could turn the DW off, the DWI off, and now we're looking only at the axial diffusivity. Let me muck for just a moment with the contrast. And now let's go to so it looks like there's some vascular stuff here. And in the lower left-hand corner, uh, you see this is a 15 micron thick slice, but now I'm making the slices thicker. And now I'm moving that back and forth. So there there's go. another perforating artery. Mm -hmm. I've been I've been playing with it. So I was explaining there to Rob what like digital sure. subtraction could be a perforating doctor. vein. <laughs> what? So could be a perforating vein. We don't know. Okay, perforated <laughs> vein. Perforating. So Marcello, you're you're probably familiar with digital subtraction and geography, right? Yeah, and and you probably have even smaller vessels there when you go when you slide back and forth. Um, but and but so yeah, that's. So it, it is my belief that if you look at that, now let's look at this. Hmm. Although I'm familiar, I would not perform as well as you do on in live camera. This is amazing. So, in a much earlier life, I built a digital subtraction angiogram. This is back in a system. This is back in 1982. And we could digitize at eight bits of, of precision. And so we would digitize a fra frame of a patient, lots of stuff in renal. We did some uh, neurovascular stuff. And then you'd inject the contrast agent and it was an intravenous contrast agent. So that was a really big deal. And then you'd subtract the two. So as you can see here in the diffusion weighted image, not surprising, the vessel is black. And if I turn, the axial on someplace, I'm sure that there is a way to subtract that from that and get rid of most of all of the rest of the parenchyma or uh, parenchyma is probably not the right word, but all of the rest of the confusing thing. The problem is that you've got a lot of these things. These are probably not, this is probably not vascular here, right? This is probably fibers, is that? Yeah, uh, I think so. Yeah, that, that looks like the start of the uh, corticospinal, cortico, uh, pontine tract. Yeah, I mean, we can put the uh, 
track density in here just for grins. Uh, Yeah, the internal capsule is a nightmare for sorting out fibers that go every which way. Yeah, because you've got the fornix there. You've got, yeah. And the blue is the fornix. The red there is the internal capsule. Whoops. It's gorgeous though. I, I feel like I'm in a in some kind of movie, Blade Runner 3. <laughs> so I worked on this last night. I was gonna surprise you today and I, I just didn't get it done. I couldn't get it quite to the point of show and tell, but I can show you what is possible. So let's, people can leave whenever they get tired of me. About. <laughs> so I'm going to turn Great. this off. It would be good to have you in Memphis. R remind me to buy, buy you some, some barbecue now. <laughs> Look at that. Look at that, Rob. That is gorgeous. That yeah. is great. Now, what have I seen here? So that's the hypothalamus being defined by all the fiber oh, oh, this tracks. Is the, this, is the, this is optic. This is the optic track. Yeah, the, the red is the optic track coming in. Yep. And I could prove that to you. Optic but... nerve, I should say, at that level. And then you can see the um, third ventricle in the middle there towards the, the left side of the image. So you see, I can take that optic track all the way back to where it inserts, come out. Uh, oh. Yep. Oh, okay. Yep. Uh, I'm seeing it now, the green. Yep. Let's turn red. Yep. Nice. Yeah. Um, the, the amazing thing, I think the, the one thing we haven't shown you, everybody, the 23 of you 20 that are still on, is the segmentation of the brains is really, really vital in terms of generating numbers from these data sets. So the pretty pictures are, are, are well, they're, they're actually stunning. But what's doubly stunning is that each one of these brains has been segmented bilaterally into 180 uh, regions. And the right-left symmetry of those regions in a mouse is uh, the, the estimated biological left-right precision is about a coefficient of variation. I'm sorry, co yeah, coefficient of variation of under 1%. No, five, in Al, five, 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 5%. I, I, uh, no, that, that I'm talking about the biological. The technical oh, okay. is under five percent. So we're we're doing really well. So that means you can squeeze numbers out of any one of those ROIs. That's cool. That <laughs> that is super cool, Al. So we we have at least one retinologist on on with us today. Uh, so so yeah, you can see how this could be used even to study retina to some extent. Certainly to get a, a lens volume. If you want an accurate lens or eye, eye weight, eye volume, you've got it. So these are the layers of the, these are the retinal layers here. Yep. And the only reason they're not colored is when we did the track density image, we had masked things so that the eyeballs were not included. And I wish we hadn't done that, but we did. Are you sure? Yeah, the, the eyeballs were not included in the track density. What we're looking at as the fractional anisotropy is the grayscale, and the color track density is a separate image calculated on a separate, on, on the same volume, but masked so that the data is tractable, no pun intended. 
Um, we just made a mistake and didn't include this region for calculating track density images. And that was James Cook uh, asking that question. And he's, he's one of Al's wizards who helps, helps make this work possible. So thank you so much, James. It's a really uh, an amazing accomplishment. I Marcella. thought I saw hints of color in there, just really, really dark. Marcelo, if you want a data set to be mapping stuff, your fMRI to, we've got a couple of good atlases, which now have the Allen Brain Atlas delineations on them. Um, what do are you these, on, what are do these you, on GitHub? Go ahead. Oh, you're, you're, you're muted, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'd like that. Um, I, I'll reach out to you. You, are they available online or the atlases that you have or? Um... Yes, and yes and no. I mean, it's kind of cumbersome and it, it depends on what you want. For every scalar output, for, for every time we pass through DSI Studio, if we're using the GQI algorithm, we get 10 different scalars. We get the B naught, the AD, the RDM, mm -hmm. you know, all that. You get the track density images. You can also get the 4D volume and throw them into DSI Studio or uh, FSL or some other thing. So it really depends on what collection of data you want. So another day, another time, let's have, we can have just a phone call or we can do this mm -hmm. and you can decide which collection of data you want because it gets, unless you've got an infrastructure like this, I'm sure you could put them into your infrastructure. I know you've got infrastructure like this, but getting them all passed and put into the right place is a pain in the backside if you if you try to get more than you really want. You're just carrying a lot of baggage along. Um, there's a GRE, there's a gradient echo with all of these. We've got four gradient echoes. We, we've got a susceptibility image. You don't want that. You probably want a an average of the four gradient echo as your anatomic image or maybe you would prefer the diffusion weighted image as your anatomic image, or maybe it's the AD. Um, in your situation, um, I should think you would probably want to have just one or two of the scalars to work with so that yes. you're, when you're doing the alignment and mapping, are you mapping them with ants? Are you mapping your data using ants? Or ants. Some, ants. Yeah. We found the, the the DWI and the FA work well. So we give you DWI, FA, and, and labels, and mm -hmm. that would probably work okay for you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I have a couple of more minutes. I just want to, uh, because this particular grant mechanism that sponsors the webinar is focused on rat genetics of substance use disorder, I just want those of you who are using rats, and that includes Howe and Olivier and uh, quite a few other people, uh, Laura. Um, we should talk about the application of these methods briefly over the next three, you know, few years to rat rat connectomics, rat substance use disorder uh, work. And I, I just want to cut to the quick on one aspect. The MR does is optimized right now for a mouse size uh, chunk of tissue, but Al tells me it wouldn't be a big deal to do half a rat brain or even a whole brain a rat brain with a little bit of tweaks of their current equipment. Um, and then the light sheet has some of the same issues with diffusion of antibodies and reagents through a, a clarity shield process brain, where again, half a brain will probably work pretty easily. Full brain will work, but maybe not with such killer um, penetration. But I, I don't see any real fundamental barriers in, in using rats. So um, I know how you've been thinking about this quite a bit. Uh, I know Megan has, and she's, she's um, had to leave. But any, anybody have kind of needs yeah, I, in the room? I, I, I do, Rob. Yeah, so we, we were interested in doing that. So we, we got all the clearing and the light sheet microscopy working in rats. And like you say, we had to do a half brain because they're just due to the size of it. But it worked very well. And um, the, the penetration of the antibody was good. The imaging was good. It worked well. The issue that we're having now is really having um, the atlas of reference and, and hooking up our pipeline 
to the atlas of reference for a rat. Um, so, and, and which rats will you use, right, for your atlas of reference? So I can't load it right at the moment, but I've got a complete rat atlas of, with DTI and all the labels there as well. Um, which, which, which strain is it? Pardon? What, which type of rat do you have? Wistar, Sprague? Uh, it's... Wistar. Wistar. Wistar, okay. That's, that'd be great because that's what we're using mostly. I mean, except the HS rods. But. So, there, uh, let's see. There's even a book. I, I've got Al's book here. He, he even graced it with a, with a note. Let me, I, let me... I found another neuroanatomist, not quite as good as Rob, uh, some guy down in Australia, Paxinos. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, George, George and I did a couple things together. Um, here is, yeah. uh, let me find. But Olivier, in the, while, while Al was show, getting ready to show you that, um, if so, we're thinking about setting up sort of an infrastructure that would be accessible to everybody for these complex workflows. It's really not our business to be building these ridiculously complicated, uh, computationally intensive workflow systems. What you want to do is upload your light sheet and your MR data and just have it work. So we're, yeah. that's why we're, one of the reasons we're talking to the group at Oak Ridge to see whether we can induce them to take this on, not just as a service, because they want to do real research. They don't want to just be, you know, they don't, they don't want to be the next Dropbox for mouse and rat brains. Um, but, but we'd love to talk to you about that. Yeah, that'd be great. I would love to do that. So this was the, uh, I think, November issue, November 2021, issue of NeuroImage, and our data was a cover. Uh, I can, I wished I had the data converted for Amiris. I could put it up there, but I don't. I can show you the difference between So this was a previous atlas that we published uh, back in 2012. This is one even before that. And this is the current one. And if you, look at this atlas versus, so let's, let's blow it up. So this is, this is Paxinos. It, it's clearly been subsampled. It's not quite fair to be doing this. Uh, then someplace down here, there's the diffusion tensor, which is really where the, the money is. So you've hey, got- Al, can you put Hey, can you put that in the message so we can all look at it with you? Uh, just drop, just find the PDF and then go over to the chat and then just drag it into the type message here. I don't know that I have that paper. Maybe I do. Olivia, have you seen this paper before? Uh, it sounds, sounds very familiar because I, I think I forwarded it to uh, my project scientist and tell her that uh, we should contact those people. <laughs> so uh, I think I think that's going to be the plan. I have a, a couple of grants that I need to submit in the next two weeks. Uh, and then after that's done, um, then I, I'll reach out with you guys and then maybe we can do a, a Zoom call. We can send you some data or you can send us your data and we can try to figure out a way to plug it in. This one is all packaged in an atlas. So are you familiar with Slicer? Yeah, I mean, from far. <laughs> well, this comes in a Slicer package. So um, the, the manuscript itself has a URL where you can just download the whole atlas okay. and the application that runs it. So okay. that, it should work. Um, it is my experience as an old person 
but some digital things sometimes don't work. For example, last night, our goddamn television, we couldn't even watch NBC News. But, you know, that's an old person. That, that's the Russians blocking it. They, it was the Russians. They only want you to watch Fox. It was the Russians, for sure. Just so you know. Yeah. Um, just a, one final uh, request for all of you who are using cool, cool rat models or mouse models, particularly any that have killer label and TH positive neurons. Uh, the whole point, Al showed the, the first fly through of the GFP, YFP mouse that was supposed to label dopaminergic neurons, but it was an abysmal failure. Uh, it labeled layer five <laughs> cortical neurons just fine, but we would love to have a killer uh, uh, YFP rat or mouse that really exposes the entire dopaminergic system. That would be, I would love that because we'd cross it in to all kinds of strains of mice, all kinds of strains of rats and understand the genetic control of dopaminergic projections. And that would be a great baseline for substance use disorder biology. And then you could do the same thing with serotonergic projections, the same things with gallon and positive projections. It would be transformative to substance use disorder stuff. And all of this, this promise of the brain initiative, it's all BS right now. I hate to say it, but if you're just using one strain of mouse, you just, you, you don't have anything other than a nice workflow. Um, nothing that really can give you traction in terms of understanding genome phenome to substance use disorders. Olivier, do you know of any cool rat? Well, I know that NIDA has the, I'm pretty sure they had the long events that Cree rats that are working. And uh, we don't have in the lab, we're not doing any dopamine stuff in the lab, so we don't have any. Uh, but I know, I think, I mean, maybe it's Alex Smith at MUIC who has done, um, who has done that. I've seen papers with over an imaging with dopaminergic neurons. So um, if I come across one, I'll, I'll send it to you. Perfect, thanks. I ask a quick question, kind of going back to my, the, my question about uh, the connectome in humans. You said that there's a lot of false positives. What do you mean by false positive? What is false? The connection itself or? <laughs> so it, you can, the way the connectomes get generated is you seed some region of the brain. Let's say you go to the motor cortex and you tell the computer, start right here and find, find the tracks coming out of the motor cortex and where do they go? And you can do things like, well, when you do that, it'll track diffusivity. It's not really tracking axons or fascicles per se. It's tracking the diffusion changes that those tissues induce. And so it's not as if you've injected a retroviral tracer. You may come along in a track and all of a sudden touch another fascicle, another collection of projections. And that track can go off and suggest that your starting point, motor cortex, is connected to something that is not meaningful. And that's what I mean by false positive. Does that make sense? So, so let me tell you, so what I have been doing is I've taken the UK Biobank's MRI derived phenotypes and we've generated genetic predictors of those. And then by doing that, then we can go to genome wide association studies based on millions of individuals and look at the, you know, whatever those image derived phenotypes represented, what are the differences between cases and controls? So, you know, I'm asking these questions to try to understand whether what we have done makes any sense or how reliable or how we should interpret these results. So it, it's controversial and I am not the right person to answer your question. There is a, a paper in Nature 
Uh, the first author is Meyer, M-A-I-E-R dash Hein, H-E-I-N. And Meyer Hein and 78 of his closest friends are the co-authors on that paper. I think every person who has been working on the human connectome was somehow involved in that paper. And it didn't get published for about a year because they were goring the sacred ox of connectometry. They were saying, you know, in some situations we have more false, false connections. If you start in a, the wrong region of the brain and say what's connected to this brain, to this region, you can find that there are more connections that are generated that are not true than the connections that they knew to be true. And, and so were I sitting in your position, I can imagine you might say, holy cow, have I been doing, been led down a garden path? I don't think it's that bad. I think what's happening is this uh, discord between the hardcore neuroscientist that wants to see a retroviral tracer following across an axon, projecting to another, jumping across the synapse and so forth. And what you're seeing in the human setting is more an anatomical feature of that region. So it's looking at all of the fascicles and it's looking at all of the projections and it's constructing some sort of mesoscale anatomic map there. And in some sense, it's almost like saying, well, what's the cortical thickness here? You, you can say, well, what are the total number of projections coming out of here? So my suspicion, and, and this is just a suspicion. Remember, I don't do what you do. I haven't looked at human images now for 25 years. But my suspicion is that you're looking at an image-derived phenotype that UK Biopank Nature paper came up with that clever term, the image-derived phenotype, which is probably a pretty robust phenotype. Is it telling you exactly whether those projections are true between A and B? Maybe there are some false connections, but if, they're, if they are evidence of the anatomy in that feature, in, in that part of the brain, it, it's probably okay. Uh, but the meyer hind paper can give you a, a better sense of that. I think it's about 2018 nature. Uh, if you send me an email, I'll find it and, and forward it to you. Okay, that would be great. So the phenotypes I'm looking at and I found interesting are the, what they call ICVF, intracellular volume fraction. So maybe it's not exactly connections, but just some measures of, uh, you know, physically interpretable measures. Um, yeah, in, in the UK Biobank, they do, it, it turns out that you can do connectivity with about four different algorithms, all of which uh, highlight different features. There's something called neurite orientation distribution indexes. There's uh, the X caliber. They're all looking at slightly different models and slightly different features of not just connectivity, but um, the density of neurites in a given region, for example. Yeah. And we're sticking with the simplest damn thing we can think about and just making sure that we do the best job for the connectivity, the connection anatomy. I think the best thing that we could be talking about is the connection anatomy might be a little bit more humble than saying the connectome. Mm -hmm. Does that help? I'm, I'm, I'm just yeah, no, this is super helpful. Thank you very much. I mean, I am doing this. I have, I don't really know much about this area. It happens that UK Biobank produced this matrix of uh, image derived phenotypes, and we could apply the methods that we developed for the transcriptome to the, to these other matrices. So, and then we're trying to interpret what that means. So Haki, my, my approach to this is, you have to treat some of the neuroanatomical imaging uh, phenotypes almost like you would a complex 
of uh, neuropsychiatric disease like schizophrenia or autism. It's mm -hmm. not one thing. You know that when you begin an autism study, it's actually 10 or 20 different things. Ditto for schizophrenia. When you do a connectome, you, you could say, yes, I did a retroviral injection and I know exactly what it is. Or you could take Al's philosophy and say, well, it's maybe three or four different things in that voxel, that are, the, the seed voxel that are going every which way. But the, the operational output is, do you get a good heritability on it? Mm -hmm. Can you map it? And if you, can, if you can answer both of those questions in the affirmative, then you've got real data, real biological data, just like you would if you mapped a schizophrenia allele to the MHC in a human population, and you could show it was very close to the C3 gene. You now have something real. And now the question is, what the hell is it? Is it really C3 or is it some, some MHC gene that happens to be nearby and how is it operating? But I, I, you know, having worked in substance abuse now, you see people get all twisted up about what is stress? What is sensitization? What is the initial activating thing? And none of those have simple answers. They're all highly complex phenotypes. So, so you just have, you know, you just kind of take it as it comes and you don't get too neurotic about getting the correct definition of stress. There ain't no such thing. So can you see the image that's up there right now? Yeah. That's the thigh one image, okay? And so how would you, how would you character, how, how would you get a single number out of this? You would say, so we're looking at just the hippocampus and that's where there's a lot of expression. And the, the complexity of, it, it's sort of fractal. The more I crank up the resolution, the more I see. And can I assign a single number to it? I, I, that's a particularly difficult thing to do. I don't know how to do that. Um, and I generate these glorious pictures. And Rob says, I don't care about the pictures. Just give me a number. I mean, he, he beats me about the, about the head. We go drinking and he says, the pictures are pretty, but just give me numbers. I, I'm poking at him again. Um, but it's hard to get, to get numbers out of pictures. It is really hard to get numbers out of pictures. You can get, I can get the value of the signal in every voxel. I, what does that mean? I could go in here and say, in this level, I can count the number of I guess this is the number of neurons that I'm looking at here, Rob. Is that right? Or I yeah, could say, well, what, or what's the length of this projection? What's the average length of the projection here? I mean, there's just gazillions of things you, you can draw from these. I think the issue that's going to be important pretty, pretty soon is to say, let's find stuff that's useful. And I think Rob just told you how to find stuff that's useful. Is that too much pontification? <laughs> well, so just, uh, related to that, what, what we've been doing, it, it, I agree with everything you just said, by the way, but uh, I mean, you gotta, you gotta get a number. So <laughs> right now what we're limited to is uh, we're just looking at density, you know, in, in sub sub region of each region. Uh, obviously, it's, it's an imperfect measure. I don't even know what that means, but we see it changing with different treatments. So then you can get funding to try to find what is the length of the axon or whatever. But um, you got to start somewhere, right? Yeah. yeah. Like that's, I said, that's so really true, you get a number, and that number should be a dollar sign with it. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so we're going to have to have a rule out. If you ask for a dollar, you have to get ten dollars. Or, or. <laughs> oh no, 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 Rob! I can't take any more of your rules. You're, you're too hard on me. <laughs> uh, I liked how you blamed me for the drive for higher resolution. That, that is actually called the Johnson law. That if, if uh, Al is temporarily satisfied with a hundred micron resolution, then it's got to be ten, and then it's got to be one. 
So you guys have been all very gracious. I sure appreciate you get, uh, taking the time to chat. And if there are things that uh, Rob can't answer, um, I, you got my email, send me email. I'm happy to chat with any of you. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. We'll also make this recording available. And then I also downloaded the papers that have been put in the chat. So we'll put those, um, link those to the presentation as well. So people have access to them. 